important and full of so many opportunities. You think about just the the climate in our in our culture right now, and how many people are just maybe primed to hear the gospel in, in ways that they wouldn't be any other time of year. Um, and it's it's such an opportunity for for us as we follow the Lord and as we're constantly loving our neighbors and connecting with them. And what opportunities for the gospel are there? Um, and then you think about the the, the times of about the joys that everyone shares as, they, as people are in from out of town and you gather with one another, but also I'm very mindful of, of different levels of sorrow and grief that people experience. That this might be their first holiday season with the, the one that they love who's, who's missing, uh, who's, who's passed on this year. And so we think about uh, those things as well. So it's just a, a swirl of, of emotions and, and opportunities. Uh, not to mention as the year down how reflective we are of, of what's happened this past year and what may happen in the year to come and just the, this, this swirling sea of just so many emotions and, and um, things that are just filling our hearts and our minds. So I thought about um, the sermon for today and, and, and thinking about, okay, what, what would serve to some extent as a capstone to some of the things that we've, we've looked at and worked on and grown through this year, and then also what might also serve to set up um, what we talked about a couple weeks ago that we want to do in 2022, where we want to root in the gospel of Matthew and, and seek afresh who is Jesus and, and what it means to be his people. What is that, that, that sort of perfect that text that I could find? And I you know, like, felt, kind of felt like I was trying on shoes this week where I was like, okay, maybe this would be the text, maybe this would be the text. But just at, at the end of the day, just kept coming back to this story in Luke 2, related to the story of Mary and the, the announcement of the angel and really the gospel that was proclaimed to her, the gospel that she proclaims in this story. The, seeing, seeing Mary hearing this good news and, and, and thinking about her role in this. Um, as, as we, we, we I, I talked about a couple weeks ago, when we're going through Matthew, we want to ask a couple questions. Who is Jesus and what does it mean to follow him? And, and I thought, man, this story of Mary just, just helps us with that in so many ways. The, the first question, who is Jesus? Again, what the angel announces to her, what she sings in her song, I mean, this really starts to get at that first question of who is Jesus. But then what does it mean to be his people? And, and, and then we see the response of Mary to the angel announcement, and she embodies that response so, so well. Um, I recognize this story is, is very familiar to some and maybe maybe unknown to others. For some, it's just a familiar children's Bible story. You've heard this story maybe in Bible classes, and, and maybe that's just all it is, is just a children's Bible story. For others, um, it's, it's unknown maybe because the only time they've ever heard uh, the, the Mary taught a, a, about is just trying to disprove something like Catholic might say about Mary or whatever, but never proactively teaching the text and hearing her story and hearing the gospel here. But recognizing, again, both familiarity and avoidance prevent us from hearing the revolutionary message that's contained in this story. So may God open our ears uh, that we may, may hear and our eyes that we may see as we turn to his scriptures together. Let's, let's pray before we begin. Father, we praise you for all your grace and love in Jesus for um, the blessings that we have through him, the comfort that we experience from him, even in the midst of this present evil age, even as we continue to suffer and experience sickness and death and loss and tears and sorrow upon sorrow, but we also experience the first fruits of your spirit and, and joy and, and peace and love, and we're, we're thankful for, for what you do in Jesus. Please speak powerfully to us all through your scriptures today, through the gospel proclamation of your son. Um, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and, and draw us to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you would, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. I want to start working through this story. We'll just take it a little section at a time. But Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the household of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. 
And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. One of the things I love most about the opening chapters of Luke is the way his storytelling just plugs us into that state of longing and expectation that so characterized the descendants of Abraham at this time. For, for generations and generations, the descendants of Abraham longed for God to fulfill his promises. The promises that, that he made to David and the prophets, that David would have a descendant who would sit on his throne and reign over an everlasting kingdom. And the, and the prophets, they picked up these promises and they expanded them. And, 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 and Isaiah talked about this root. And, and uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they longed for this this son of David to come and rule over the people and bring restoration of God's reign and to, to uh, overcome uh, evil and overcome their enemies and bring about salvation and rescue and justice and peace. All these things that we long for from the depths of our being. The, the prophets carried these things out and, and foretold these things. And then you could go back even farther to the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And go back even farther to the garden itself, what Andy just read for us. You think about that promise that was made there in the garden in the wake of that first betrayal and rebellion against God. Yet what did God promise? That a seed of woman, a descendant of woman, would come in and crush the head of the serpent. And so these promises just built up, built up for generations after, and, and, and generations. And as the, the, the descendants of Abraham suffered under wave after wave of, of, of oppression from foreign powers, right? First the Babylonians, the Persians, the, 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 the Greeks, the Romans, all these people ruling over them and, and uh, taking away their, their rights and liberties and just holding them under their, their, their power and pressure, they would cling even more tightly to the promises of God. And these stories in Luke chapters 1 and 2 show us now the beginning of fulfillment. Just, just when these promises of God are just beginning to be fulfilled. You think about the promises about the Spirit in particular. How they're described as God saying, I'll give my Spirit like a torrential downpour from heaven so he'd give his, his Spirit. These, these early stories just show us those first few raindrops of the Spirit starting to trickle out onto the, onto the earth. Luke's already told us of an angel announcement and a, mer and a miraculous pregnancy. An older priestly couple like Abraham and Sarah, they were both very old. She was barren, and now she's pregnant and about to give birth to a son. Our story is that of another angel announcement, another miraculous pregnancy, except this one is even greater. And so our story opens up in the city of Nazareth, this insignificant nowhere place in the northern region of Galilee, um, you might think about John 1 and, and Nathaniel's statement when he learns about Jesus of Nazareth and the famous, can anything good come from Nazareth, right? We need to hear that sort of disdain and that judgment, almost condescending attitude when we hear the word Nazareth, because again, it's a nowheresville, right? Insignificant uh, place. And yet this is where the story opens. And Luke introduces us to this virgin betrothed to a man um, named Joseph of the house of David helpful to understand a, just a brief word on betrothal uh, at this time, right? So the idea was that um, a young Jewish girl would be betrothed uh, to a man, and that was, that was broken down into a couple, couple phases. The first phase lasted about a year, and it would be this sort of official legal engagement, uh, and, and, and then the wedding ceremony would happen a year later. And what's striking to us about this is it was 
typical for that to happen when the girl was 12, right? So she'd be betrothed at the age of 12 and then fully officially married by the age of 13. We, the text doesn't tell us exactly how old Mary was at this time, but I think we're meant to see her as a very young woman at this time, probably a teenage girl around, around there. Um, she would have been very young. But even more significant than the background of the, of the betrothal is this little line we're introduced to when Joseph's introduced. He was named Joseph of the house of David. And when we hear that, right, we should just get this sort of buzz and tingle, right? Because now we're, we're alerted to the promises of God and remembering these promises of God to David and through David, right? Um, and so the heavenly messenger greets, uh, Gabriel greets Mary as just this object of God's grace. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. You have found favor with God. That word for favor is what, is what we think of this translated grace, right? She is this, this one who is just the recipient of God's, of God's grace. And so here again, then, this announcement to her, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. You'll conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. That's the Greek form of the, the Hebrew name Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. Name him Yahweh is salvation, or Yahweh saves he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Can you hear, again, 2 Samuel 7, can you hear Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all these, these just this beautiful hope from the prophet just coming forward, rushing forward now in this announcement to Mary. The promises are being fulfilled. The promised king uh, from the line of David is coming and Mary, this young, probably teenage girl from nowhere, probably very poor, will be his mother. I mean, it's the most incredible thing. Mary, no doubt, in some state of surprise or awe, shock, asks the question, how can this be? How is this going to happen? Unlike the doubting of Zechariah in the previous story, this seems to just be a request for information, not for proof. She's not saying, prove it to me in the same way that Zechariah did, but how is this going to happen? Right? The village teenager is more responsive to God's power than the Jerusalem priest. And the child would be the adopted, not the biological son of Joseph. Rather, Mary would conceive the child through the Holy Spirit. Again, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, he shall be called the Son of God. And then he says, and nothing will be impossible with God. Understand what this means for Mary. Okay? Step back and appreciate her in this moment. Right? Again, the, the text just rattles so fast, but, but you're this young teenage girl from nowhere and the angel appears to you and sets this in front of you, right? On one hand, you have the most profound personal honor, a visit from an angel announced as one graced by God and her role in the purpose of God in his coming kingdom, that she would give birth to the Messiah himself. So you have on one hand this profound personal honor but then you have this profound personal cost for her role in this story, right? Think about the suspicion, the shame, the scandal associated with her, pre her pregnancy in this hyper-moralistic purity culture of first century Judaism. What would people think when they see this woman who's, not, who's, who's engaged more or less to, to Joseph but not fully married and she turns up pregnant? Can you hear the whispers? Can you see the di dirty looks? Can you feel the sort of the judgment that just, y y you've been in those environments before where you just feel it in the air. Mary would walk into one place or the other and can you just feel the people in the market turning towards her or the people in the synagogues turning towards her? What would her family think? What would, what would Joseph think? Imagine telling your family and your husband that you were not actually unfaithful to your, your vows and your commitment, but that you're pregnant by the Holy Spirit. You know, it just happens, right? 
I mean, think, think about, like, th think about that seriously. It sounds ridiculous. You don't just say, an angel appeared to me and, and I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Who, who believes that? Matthew 1 gives us a glimpse into that personal cost. When, when Joseph is, is thinking about putting Mary away and he's trying to save her public disgrace, thank God that he was righteous enough to at least consider her that much, right? But he, had, he had, was well within his right to get, make a public display of her or worse. As all of that and more might flash through Mary's mind at this time, that, that honor... The cost. How does Mary respond? Behold the slave of the Lord. May it be done for me according to your word. It's amazing. Simple acceptance. Faith. Trust. Obedience. Trust in God. What we see in this, this, this little line... Behold, the slave of the Lord, may it be done for me according to your word. What you see in this single line, this response of Mary, the mother of Christ, is the perfect embodiment of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Right? You read through the Gospels and you, you ask this question, what does it mean to be a, a, a follower of, of Christ? What does it mean to be the people of God? It's exactly what we're seeing in Mary here. Not perfect knowledge, not perfect understanding, not, man, just that simple Faith, trust, obedience, devotion. When we make a list of heroes of faith, Mary needs to be near the top of our list. Well, the story goes on. Now at this time, Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord." So after Gabriel leaves Mary, she quickly, at some point, soon afterwards, hurries off to the hill country of Judea, to, to this city there to visit her relative Elizabeth, right? And, and, and Elizabeth had been mentioned by the angel in, in, the, in the vision, that she'd conceived a son in her old age. Um, and so she comes to, to who might be the, the only one who actually understands what Mary's experiencing, what she's going through. The only safe place for her to figure things out, to find refuge, comfort, encouragement, advice, just, just some solidarity, some camaraderie. And this scene is just bursting with emotion. I, I, I put it as my header for this, just too many emotions to count. Put yourself in this scene for just a minute and, 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 and imagine Elizabeth and all that she's experiencing, Mary and all that she's experiencing, and just this swirl and layers and layers of joy, right? What we're seeing in this is layers and layers of grief, and, and, and disgrace turn to joy. Think, think about this from Elizabeth's perspective for a minute, right? Um, how many years had, had Elizabeth and Zacharias prayed for a child before they gave up? Now, we don't know the answer to that question, but just, just asking the question itself, how long did they pray? How many years and years and years did they pray for a child before they would have stopped praying? I'm too old now. And just all the, 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 the grief and the disappointment that would go along with that. I, any who have struggled with infertility, who've struggled with miscarriage, who, who've suffered from miscarriages, know that ache, know that grief, right? This is, this is Elizabeth. Add to that the, the, the culture that she's living in where her, her role, her identity was in her ability to bear children, and she's not able to do that. You get a sense of this after she becomes pregnant. Listen to what's said in Luke 125. She says, this is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. She's looked at her life prior to this as just one of disgrace. She's never been able to have a child. And now in her old age, 
God's taken that disgrace away from her. But, but that's, just, that's just one layer of grief and disgrace, right? Think about where, where uh, Elizabeth and Mary are and their, their roles in, 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 in the, the, the people they're a part of, right? Think, think about Israel's disgrace, right? Uh, generation after generation under oppressive foreign powers, a legacy of idolatry and injustice and faithfulness. You, you, you go back and you read the story of Israel, and though there are certainly heroes of faith that make their appearance in the story, the story of Israel is a story of sin and rebellion against God. And so th- their whole legacy is one of, of, of grief and disgrace. And then you add on top of that, what, what that's built upon is, is humanity's grief and disgrace. Israel's story is the story of humanity. From the first betrayal in the garden and the grief and the disgrace that flowed from that like an avalanche that just characterized where we are in humanity. I want to share this drawing. I saw this sometime back in 2020. Maybe, maybe some of you have seen this online. It's a, it's a drawing called The Virgin Mary Comforts Eve or something to that effect. Or, yeah, comforts Eve. And it's a, it's a, a little pencil and, and uh, crown drawing, right? Um, but it's, a, it's an imagined scene where here's Mary, pregnant with a child, having an opportunity to, to comfort Eve. And, and there's all sorts of symbolism baked into this, even, even the background with the arch and sort of putting them in a garden setting. You see the serpent curling around Eve's leg, but notice... What, where the head is under Mary's foot because in her, in her belly is that seed of woman that would crush the serpent's head and empower the people of God to crush the serpent's head. But what, what strikes me more than anything is the expression on Eve's face in this drawing. You look at it from one angle and, it, and initially you see that sort of grief and that just regret, knowing what she's done, and, and not just what Eve personally has done, but what that represents uh, for all of us, right? Because we've all gone the same way, right? But you can see on one hand, you, you, you can look at her expression, and you see that grief and that regret on, on the verge of tears from, from what she's done wrong, but also you can look at it, and you can see just that hope and that longing. The curse is, is ending, right? It's not always going to be that way. God will fulfill his promises. God will bring that savior, redeemer, that snake crusher. He's right there, right? And so you can see that hope and that joy and just that that holding back of tears from that, right? And so all of this grief, all of this disgrace swirling together and turned into joy um, when 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 we think about overflowing joy in, in, in this encounter between Elizabeth and Mary, And now all that hope and that joy is now concentrated into the wombs of two women, one very old and one very young. And so it's from this mountain of emotions that Mary gives voice to a prophetic song of praise and proclamation of the gospel. Listen to 1 verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He's done mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. And so Mary had the gospel proclaimed to her through this announcement by the angel, but now in this, again, prophetic song and, and, and of praise and proclamation, she's proclaiming the gospel as well, that this king is coming, that God is, is affecting his reign, and we see this same great reversal that we saw back at the, earlier on in the year, I did a, a sort of addendum to our justice series where we looked at the song of Hannah, right? This is the, the sort of next level version of Hannah's song where we see that same <clears throat> great reversal portrayed here in Mary's song. 
What I want to do for just a minute is, is just step back from this scene and just take a second to kind of what I call gaze at the gospel. Right? We, we've seen this in the, in the announcement of the angel and this, the joy swirling around the greeting of, of Elizabeth and Mary and then this, this, this truth that is just belting from her song. But I don't want to s- stare at this for just a minute. What, what do we see when we look at this, at this story? One, again, I want to just say again, the faith of a young girl. Again, any, any list of our heroes of faith, Mary needs to be at the top of our list. Another thing I want us to see is the God of the incarnation. Think about, think about what we're seeing about God in this event, right? The, the fact that as John, to use language from John's gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and the, and the events surrounding that happening, right? Particularly what we're reading here in Luke regarding this virgin birth. You have on one hand miraculous conception, and then on the other hand, mundane, even, even scandalous pregnancy, right? This sort of melding of those two things, this great miracle where she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and yet the Son of God enters the world in the same way we all do, right? In the darkness of Mary's womb, in the darkness of a mother's womb, right? And it was this normal pregnancy where she would have experienced what pregnant women experience. Was she, did she experience morning sickness? How hard, how painful was her labor? That, that, that again, that, that sacred and common, that miraculous and mundane, that divine and human, all brought together in one. So we see that when we stare at the, the gospel in this story. We see the God who honors the insignificant. Again, a disgraced, barren, older woman and an unmarried, poor teenage girl from nowhere are given these roles of incredible significance and honor in the story of God. Just as the words of this song, uh, he's had had regard for the humble state of his slave. He's raised up, exalted the humble Right, this is our God who has, who has regard and, and, and gives significance and place of honor to those who are seemingly insignificant. And with that, we see the God of the right side up kingdom. Right? Maybe you hear the phrase upside down kingdom, and that's right because that points us to the fact that our normal way of viewing the world, God's ways are upside down. But the reality is, is his kingdom is right side up. We're the ones that are walking upside down. Right? with our values of, of elevating pride and elevating wealth and elevating power and elevating all these sorts of things. Who do we honor? Who do we value? Who do we hold up? God flips that upside down or flips that right side up. Again, listen to the words of this, this, this praise echoing the, the, the words of Hannah's song. Uh, he has done mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers from thrones exalted those who were humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. He sent away the rich empty-handed. And all of this is his mercy and remembrance to his people and his promises. And so we see the God who keeps his promises. Again, they waited for so long, seemingly without any word, any update, any sign that God was doing anything or that God was even there hearing them, seeing them for them at all. Right, the, 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 the songs in the Psalms would just resonate so deeply. You think about even the ending of Psalm 88. I just sit in darkness. My only friends are darkness. Right? How, how that would so resonate with them as they just experience suffering and suffering and suffering and oppressor after oppressor after oppressor. And yet, here it is. God keeps his promises. We live in a, a similar time to the Hebrew people waiting on the promises of God, waiting for God to fulfill his promises. We are so far removed from the events of themselves, just like Elizabeth, just like Mary, we're so far removed from the events of Ezekiel's day and Jeremiah's day and Isaiah's day and certainly removed from the the time of King David and the time of Abraham. We're so far removed from these events ourselves. On one hand, 
we know more and we can see more, right? We, we see how God began to fulfill these things in Jesus and we've got that sense of resolution. But in our day, God seems just as silent, just as distant, just as absent. We can seem that way. We suffer. We struggle with money. We struggle with health. We struggle with relationships. We see corruption. We see brokenness. We see injustice. We see idolatry all around us. Um, we repeatedly stare death in the face. I, I was thinking about a, an, an email Linda sent a, a, couple, a month or so ago, and she just said, how many people had we lost in the last two years? Right? Repeatedly stare death in the face. It's been 2,000 years. Will Christ really return? Will he set things right? Will he make things new? Will he save us? Will we live with him? Will we reign with him? Yes. Yes, we will. Resounding yes. We relate to these stories in our waiting. The... They sing songs of comfort and hope to our hearts as we hear this gospel proclaimed and we see that God keeps his promises. Let's pray together. Father, we are in awe of your grace we see grace in the lives of Elizabeth and Mary, and we can see grace in our own lives as well. And we see an incredible work of grace in your son. In these early announcements leading up to his birth, we see it in his baptism. We see grace in his overcoming Satan in the wilderness. We see grace in his teaching and proclaiming your kingdom. We see grace in the ways that he healed and had compassion on those that were suffering with blindness and poverty, the sinners and tax collectors, the lame and the deaf, and those that had lost those that they loved. We see grace in the days and hours leading up to his betrayal and arrest and mock trials and his death, his crucifixion on the cross. Grace in the fullest measure. And we see it in his resurrection, that sign of, of new creation. We continue to experience grace as we live under his reign now and we long for grace to be fully revealed at his return. We're so thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace and your patience and your kindness towards us. Please continue to, to carry us and strengthen us and empower us as we experience the fallout of this present evil age, as we experience suffering and loss and disappointment, um, just never realizing what we want to realize, always falling short of, of some ideal or goal, whatever it is in our life. As we continue to experience death and loss and heartache and grief, yet we know that you are with us and we cling to your promises and we cling to the stories of your faithfulness and your power and your presence. We ask that you would strengthen us and equip us and empower us and lead us into the new year um, with greater faith, with greater hope that we would be your people of love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning and you need our prayers, um, for anything, if you're ready to give your life to Christ and, and share in the joy and power of his kingdom, we would love to baptize you in the name of Jesus. If there's anything we can do for you, please come forward as we stand and sing.